Freezing spray clawed across a steel runway as a carrier drove hard through winter seas. Engines howled, deck plates shuddered, and an F-14 seemed one heartbeat from the edge. Officers on the bridge weighed two bad options. Ease the throttle and jeopardize timing, or hold fast and let the storm test the ship to its core. They chose speed. What followed became a quiet legend among sailors who work where water meets wind and judgment meets physics, an episode whose key decision we will reveal later in this video. For now, fix this picture in your mind. Ice on metal, cables stretched like bowstrings, and thousands of people relying on choreography measured in seconds. Before we begin, make sure to hit the like button. It helps us beat the YouTube algorithm. Why keep pushing when waves tower high enough to blot the horizon? Because carriers exist to solve problems that cannot wait. A carrier's runway is a flight deck, and that runway moves. Safe aviation depends on consistent wind over the deck, which often means maintaining significant speed even when seas turn hostile. Slowing too far risks losing steerage, reducing airflow for recoveries, and missing launch windows precisely planned around fuel states, airspace constraints, and mission demands that do not pause for weather. The peril is not abstract. In December 1944, a violent Pacific typhoon overturned multiple destroyers, including USS Hull, USS Spence, and USS Monaghan, costing hundreds of lives. Carriers in the same system survived because teams manipulated heading, ballast, and speed to meet seas at the least damaging angles. Decades later, tragedies still underline how water can surprise modern vessels. In late November 2022, a single rogue wave struck a cruise ship near Antarctica, killing one passenger and injuring several others at comparatively modest speed. Scale that force to a warship traveling at aviation tempo, and the stakes become unmistakable. Before we continue, make sure to hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. A Nimitz-class carrier displaces roughly 100,000 tons, moves with nuclear power, and when conditions demand, makes sustained high speed. That might sound placid compared with aircraft, yet the energy exchange between hull and sea grows immense as speed rises. Each crest is an event. Each trough is a test of structure, seamanship, and anticipation. The ship's bow is designed to cut, not hop, so green water can sweep aboard in sheets when angles misalign. Surviving those moments is less about brute strength than about reading wave trains, matching periods, and letting engineering and human coordination work in concert. On the bridge, the officer of the deck orchestrates that dance. Radar, visual cues, and accelerometers tell a changing story of wave height, spacing, and direction. The helmsman holds a commanded course against gusts that twist the rudder's bite. Quartermasters track pressure changes, sea states, and the gentle lies that storms tell when one set disguises the next. The watch team's adjustments can be small, one or two degrees of heading, a knot of speed either way. But timing is everything. The goal is to crest where forces are friendliest and to keep the bow from burying while preserving the airflow pilots need to land. Flight operations under these conditions demand choreography on the deck that borders on acrobatic. Directors marshal aircraft while watching both the wind line and the ship's pitch. Arresting gear crews tune hydraulic and energy absorption settings for each model and weight class, knowing the deck may heave at touchdown. Landing signal officers scan glide slopes and lens indications while compensating for deck motion, which does not move uniformly. Pilots commit to approaches in which the runway's position over time matters more than its position at any single instant. Everyone involved understands. Timing beats brute force. When the ship races into big seas, the deck team secures every movable object, from tie-down chains to toolboxes. A loose wrench, amplified by spray and momentum, becomes dangerous. Jet blast deflectors cycle under load, while steam or electromagnetic launch systems are readied with extraordinary care. The crew routes traffic to minimize FOD, foreign object debris, and adjusts spotting so aircraft that need fuel or maintenance remain reachable without unsafe towing arcs. The scene appears calm on camera. In person, the vibration underfoot and the roar of wind over superstructure make focus a learned skill. Deep below, engineering spaces hum with steadiness that looks effortless only to outsiders. Reactor operators balance control rods and coolant flow to meet power demands while keeping margins safe. Main machinery watchstanders listen for the subtle changes big seas impose, bearings that sing a little higher, shaft lines that load slightly harder when a crest lifts the stern, lube oil pressures, condenser vacuums, and feed water chemistry receive relentless attention. It is an irony of heavy weather. The harder the ship works to seem composed, 
the more hands are busy preserving that composure. Navigation teams thread needles measured in nautical miles and minutes. Meteorology provides models of wind fields and wave spectra, but the ocean is never a laboratory. Forecasters and quartermasters fuse satellite products, buoy reports, and onboard observations to pick headings that shave the sharpest edges from the sea state while holding the track that operations require. Sometimes that means sailing a longer arc to cross wave trains at more forgiving angles. Sometimes it means sprinting through a window before a secondary low spins up. The math is clinical. The consequences are human. Communications specialists maintain links that storms try to break. Ionospheric conditions shift, rain fades, satellite paths, and vibration rattles connectors not designed for continuous pounding. Redundant circuits, alternate bands, and even visual signaling ensure control of aircraft and coordination among escorts persists when electrons misbehave. Controllers vector returning jets to intersect a moving wake, mindful of fuel state, divert fields, and turbulence close to the deck. The difference between an elegant sequence and a dangerous scramble is often a single clear transmission arriving at the right second. Damage control is both doctrine and culture. Teams drill to isolate flooding, shore weakened structures, and restore systems without waiting for seas to calm. Portable pumps, emergency welding kits, and patching materials stand ready in lockers whose locations sailors memorize. During high-speed transits in rough water, these teams stoge near probable trouble spots, voids in the bow, catwalks near the waist, and spaces under machinery that feels the ship's flex. The rule is simple. Find, fight, and finish the casualty, fast enough that the next wave does not turn a manageable problem into a cascading one. Medical departments adapt a hospital to a moving world. Stretchers are strapped, instruments tethered, and surgical teams rehearse how to pause and protect during sudden lurches. Typical heavy weather injuries include contusions, fractures and lacerations from unexpected motion or equipment shifts. Preventive measures matter too. Handholds placed where hands naturally go, non-skid surfaces kept in good order, and sleep schedules adjusted to mitigate fatigue when constant motion steals rest. Healthcare at sea is logistics, ergonomics, and empathy, all delivered while deck and hull continue their long conversation with the storm. Now comes the revelation promised at the opening. The bridge team that night chose a counterintuitive blend of speed and angle, deliberately increasing revolutions to create steadier apparent wind, while rotating the bow a few degrees off the dominant swell to meet a secondary set that had begun to stack. That micro change prevented the bow from burying on the next pattern, saved aircraft from pounding shock on approach, and preserved the window needed to recover the last cycle. It looked like stubborn speed. In truth, it was finesse, speed used as a tool, not as bravado. Historical experience underwrites our decisions. After the 1944 disaster, procedures evolved to require tighter control of ballast and fuel distribution before major weather, ensuring metacentric height and roll periods stayed within survivable bands. Later storms reinforced the importance of rigging for heavy weather early, securing deck cargo, inspecting closures, and staging damage control. Each near miss chisels a lesson into checklists and training plans. Modern carriers embody those lessons in both steel and standard operating procedures refined by decades of testing against the sea's patients. Technology helps, but never replaces judgment. Optical landing systems stabilize visual cues even as the deck bobs. Motion reference units feed real-time data to controllers and pilots allowing subtle corrections on final. Weather routing software ingests data streams to forecast wave fields hours ahead, though seasoned navigators still step outside to read water by eye. On some ships, advanced algorithms predict the probability of rogue wave formation minutes in advance, creating just enough time to alter speed or heading to blunt the worst. None of this eliminates risk. It shifts odds in humanity's favor. Flight deck procedures adapt with sea state. When pitch and roll exceed set thresholds, Recoveries shift to profiles that tolerate more vertical movement, and launch timing synchronizes to the ship's oscillation. Arresting gear settings account for aircraft weight and wind over deck, but also for the measured motion of the landing area. Pilots brief bolter plans that consider where the stern will be if the arrestment fails. Taxi directors shorten tow runs and spot aircraft to reduce exposure near deck edges. Every action buys a little time or a little space, two currencies that storms devalue quickly. Life inside the ship changes rhythm too. Supply teams secure storerooms so cans, filters, and spares stay put. Culinary specialists brace trays and redesign service lines to prevent scalds or spills when the deck suddenly tilts. Postal clerks, yeomen, and dispersing staff keep administrative lifeblood flowing, 
so families ashore feel connected and sailors afloat feel seen. Morale is not cosmetic. In storms that last days, the difference between steady hands and frayed nerves can trace back to a hot meal, a functioning laundry, or a letter opened after a long watch. Aviation maintenance crews work miracles under limits. Hydraulics do not care that the ship is rolling, neither do avionics that dislike moisture. Technicians set up dry zones, tarp-sensitive gear, and use portable dehumidifiers to protect electronics. When engines need bore scope inspections or component swaps, team leads decide what can safely wait and what must proceed, balancing mission readiness with human safety. The ultimate constraint is physics. If a part demands torque values that cannot be applied safely while the deck heaves, the repair moves indoors or moves to a calmer hour. Escorts ride the weather too. Cruisers and destroyers maintain station within tight tolerances, using their own hull forms to slice or shoulder seas that approach from inconvenient angles. Plane guard stations adjust, so a helicopter has a safer hover environment if needed. Logistic ships time alongside operations for lulls or delay them entirely when underway replenishment would add unacceptable hazard. Across the formation, commanders trade messages that knit separate challenges into a single plan whose success is measured in uneventful returns and quiet maintenance periods afterward. Training makes this orchestration possible. Simulators reproduce decks that heave and pitch with unnerving realism letting bridge teams practice meeting seas at various angles while holding wind envelopes for flight ops. Damage control trainers flood compartments on command to force rapid boundary setting and pump placement. Medical drills add movement to procedures, so muscle memory includes bracing and pausing. Aviation simulators inject deck motion models into landing practice, so pattern work habituates pilots to the lag between what I see and what the landing area will be a heartbeat later. From time to time, heavy weather writes itself into investigation folders. One near loss of aircraft during a northern exercise in the 1980s forced changes in tie-down standards and spotting rules when barometric pressure falls rapidly. Another event in the early 2000s highlighted how a single, steep-fronted wave could deform catwalk sections and flood spaces through tiny lapses in material condition. Afterward, inspection intervals tightened and closure training intensified. Each report adds friction to routines, but that friction is intentional designed to bleed energy from the kinds of accidents that thrive on haste. Human performance remains a limiting factor. Prolonged motion erodes sleep and stiffens muscles. Leaders stagger watch rotations so fatigue does not line up across critical billets at the same time. Chaplains, corpsmen, and chiefs walk spaces to sense morale and intervene early. Hydration and nutrition matter more than slogans. Salt spray, cold, and vibration take a toll that creeps. The ethic afloat is simple and meticulous. Prevent the preventable, cushion the inevitable, and recover quickly when the sea inevitably finds a gap in your plan. Consider the pilot breaking out of cloud at night to see a runway whose far end vanishes behind spray. The ship surges. The lens holds steady thanks to stabilization. The radio call is calm. The hook snags a wire. Momentum drains into engines and hydraulics. The aircraft stops short of a deck edge, blurred by foam. That quiet sequence represents thousands of deliberate choices made by people you never see. A forecast adjusted, a course altered two degrees, a maintenance action completed, a damage control locker restocked, a cook starting coffee early for a tired team. Engineering design absorbs punishment but needs help from sailors. Hull girder strength, watertight integrity, and compartmentation distribute loads and arrest flooding paths, yet valves still need hands to spin them. Hatches need minds to dog them, and coatings need brushes to renew them after salt eats away at protection. Cathodic systems reduce corrosion. Non-skid prevents falls. Shock-mounted equipment survives pounding that would doom rigid mounts. The sea tests every oversight, so prevention is a daily chore, not a seasonal activity. Weather knowledge has grown more sophisticated. Instead of calling seas rough, teams discuss dominant periods, spectral peaks, and crossing seas that create confused motion. Rogue waves, once dismissed as sailors' tales, are modeled as statistical outliers with mechanisms like wave focusing and current interactions. That understanding informs operational choices. Avoid opposing strong currents with gale force winds, beware shelf breaks that steepen waves, and respect secondary systems riding the shoulders of primary lows. The vocabulary may be technical, but its purpose is practical. Keep people alive and missions on track. Operations do not pause simply because the barometer falls. Humanitarian assistance may require reaching a coast quickly. Deterrent patrols must show presence regardless of sea state. Rescue missions often begin when others are already in trouble. 
The paradox of carrier work is that the safest place for aircraft may be a moving deck in a storm, because airfields ashore can close and diversions may be out of range. That reality drives decisions that, from the outside, can look like daring for its own sake. From the inside, they are calculated compromises made by professionals. Future ships aim to tame motion further, refined hull forms reduce slamming, active stabilization lessens roll, and smarter control laws for rudder and propulsors keep headings tighter when seas push. Flight decks and arresting systems continue to evolve to manage energy more predictably under dynamic loads. Predictive analytics will link sensor streams, strain gauges, motion sensors, weather feeds, into advisors that recommend headings and speeds minute by minute. These are aids, not autopilots. They free human attention for the decisions only judgment can make. Culture ties everything together. Carriers operate like small cities, but unlike cities, they require synchronized action to survive bad hours. Pride is quiet and collective, a well-run watch turnover, a tight logbook, a gear room where every item is where it should be. Junior sailors learn quickly that doing the small thing right, coiling a line, labeling a valve, inspecting a gasket, prevents the big thing from going wrong when the ocean decides to test the chain. The reward for this discipline is not applause. It is an uneventful sunrise after a hard night. None of this sanctifies risk. Leaders constantly reevaluate whether the goal justifies pressing on. If weather closes the window beyond safe limits, operations pause. If an alternate route offers similar timing with less exposure, the rudder turns. Courage at sea is not the absence of caution. It is the insistence on clarity when ambiguity tempts shortcuts. That clarity shows up in pre-underway briefings that plan for heavy weather days before forecasts turn red, and in post-event debriefs that pull humility from success as readily as lessons from mistakes. At the level of individual sensations, heavy weather is sound and feel, a low hum turning into a drumbeat as the bow pounds, a chair that needs a knee to keep it from skittering, a coffee mug that must be braced at the moment a crest lifts the stern. People learn to move with the ship, not against it. That embodied knowledge paired with procedure and instrumentation reduces the surprise inside surprise, the little ricochets of chaos that injure hands and delay actions when seconds count most. The public often imagines carriers only in calm postcards, blue water, clean wakes, jets arcing into sunny sky. The truth includes steel under strain, people who measure their professionalism by how invisible their effort appears, and decisions made in winds that flatten speech. When a carrier group arrives where it was told, when aircraft land in sequences that seem inevitable, and when the headlines say little because nothing broke, that quiet is the product of a thousand practice choices under pressure the camera cannot capture. Remember to hit like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Your support means a lot.